Buenos días, bienvenidos otra vez a LITAM, a nuestro segundo día del seminario sobre desarrollo y capital natural. Eh, quiero dar la más cordial bienvenida a todos ustedes, en especial al profesor Charles Perings. Professor Perings, it's a great honor to have you with us here. Welcome to LITAM and welcome to this joint effort among uh, Conavio and uh, the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México. You have many fans here and we are going to be thrilled to hear you today here. Thanks a lot. Déjenme darles una breve reseña. Sorry, I'm going to present you in Spanish, if that's all right. Let me, déjenme darles una, una breve reseña del profesor Perings. Él es, como ustedes saben, uno de los académicos más prestigiosos en el ramo de la economía del medio ambiente y los recursos naturales. Es presidente de la Sociedad Internacional de Economía Ecológica, director del Programa de Biodiversidad del Instituto Beiger de Estocolmo, de la Real Sociedad Sueca de las Ciencias, profesor de la Universidad de Zambia y profesor de la Universidad de California en Estados Unidos. Actualmente es profesor de la Universidad Estatal de Arizona. Los principales temas de investigación del Dr. Perings son la resiliencia, el desarrollo sustentable, las especies invasoras y la evaluación de la naturaleza en términos económicos. Ahora es parte de un grupo de investigación que se dedica a evaluar la resiliencia bajo diferentes circunstancias ambientales y económicas del, del Canal de Panamá, junto con el Instituto Smithsoniano. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very, very much again to be here with us. Yes. So thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, I am very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you. I am embarrassed that I cannot speak to you in Spanish, uh, but I hope that my English will be sufficiently clear that you can follow what it is that I'm saying. I was asked to think about the opportunities for poverty alleviation through biodiversity conservation. And that's the topic of my talk today. What I'm going to do is walk through several different dimensions of this problem. Um, I'm going to look at the relationship between biodiversity and a term that everyone here I think will be familiar with, natural capital. And I'm going to try to connect this to the agreements that we currently have nationally and internationally to deal with biodiversity. Implicit in these agreements is a set of property rights and every asset, every part of our wealth is defined by the property rights associated with that asset. So this turns out to be a very important problem. How is the ownership of biodiversity decided? I'm going to look uh, for a particular example at more heavily impacted or managed ecosystems. But what I'm going to have to say will apply to less managed ecosystems as well. And I'm, as an example, going to take a look at the relationship between maize and Tiacente in Mexico. Um, but what I'm going to have to say about maize could be said about many different species. So this should be taken as an example. And I'm going to close by looking at the implications this has for the property rights that farmers, farming communities, ejidos, have in the living assets at their disposal. So to begin with, go back to the Brundtland Report, Our Common Future. That's the place where the connection between poverty and biodiversity was first explored. And this is the basis for most people's perception of the relationship between those two things. 
They observe that people in many parts of the world are caught, as they said, in a vicious downward spiral. What they meant by that is that people who are poor will very often destroy their immediate environment in order to survive. That the exigencies of the present dominate the concerns for the future. So that was the way in which initially we were encouraged to think about the relationship between poverty and biodiversity. And that same basic idea has been followed through since that time. Now I'll come to a modern statement of that idea in a moment. But first of all, let me just look briefly at the evidence that we have at a national level for the relationship between wealth and poverty. This figure comes from data that the World Bank now generate on what they call adjusted net savings. Savings are the prelude to investment. If you don't save, you cannot invest. And so what they're looking for is a measure of investment. They're trying to identify what countries are putting aside for building assets for the future. In this case, however, they're trying to extend the notion of assets to include not just financial capital, produced capital, but also other categories of cap capital that are not normally considered human capital, social capital, and most importantly, natural capital. So they're asking through their measure of adjusted net savings whether countries are building their natural capital or allowing it to decay. What the figure indicates is, for different groups of countries, how their adjusted net savings have evolved over time. The zero line here indicates the savings rate that would yield no change in assets. So anything above the zero line indicates positive savings. And for all groups of countries, low income, high income, and middle income, for most of this period, they were saving at a positive rate. So they were accumulating capital. But for a particular group of countries, the heavily indebted poor countries, this is a category uh, that the International Monetary Fund has uh, created in order to target some of its uh, policy measures. The heavily indebted poor countries were below the line for most of that period. What that means is they were running down their natural capital. They were running down their capital assets in total, but in many cases it's because they were running down natural capital. Whoops. More recently, uh, a publication has been produced by the United Nations University and UNEP called the Inclusive Wealth Report. Now this is not, uh, it doesn't cover as many countries as the World Bank's adjusted net savings, but it attempts to do much the same thing, to determine whether countries are increasing or decreasing their national wealth. Uh, all of the countries that are indicated in very light gray here were not subject to study. Only the countries in the different sets of colors uh, were subject to the study. And they divide into two groups, those for which the uh, percentage annual growth rate of assets was positive, and those for which the percentage annual growth rate of assets was negative. So they identified a series of countries, these, for which the net growth rate of assets was negative. Again, countries running down their asset base. They're becoming poorer in terms of wealth. And in most cases, again, this is because they were running down natural capital. 
Now, for both of these studies, natural capital is very narrowly defined. It includes oil resources, mineral resources, forest stocks, but it doesn't include measures of biodiversity. Nevertheless, we would expect to find a relationship between national wealth and biodiversity change that would map into these results. So let me come back to a modern statement of the Brooklyn Report. An important paper in 2009 by Jeffrey Sachs and many, many others um, argued for the integration of poverty alleviation and biodiversity conservation agendas. They claimed that there is reason to believe that if you develop policies for enhancing biodiversity conservation, you could at the same time improve people's well-being. You could improve people's wealth. They called for several things action to identify and quantify the links between biodiversity and ecosystem services and poverty reduction. They called for evidence-based interventions addressing both poverty and sustainability of the environment. They called for development that protects biodiversity and maintains ecosystem services. And then they included this, better access to seeds, market and expertise combined with adaptive applications of technologies. Now I'm going to be thinking in my talk about this last thing here. But before I do that, I have some general observations to make. The evidence, unfortunately, at the national level is that biodiversity conservation and poverty alleviation do not go hand in hand. The evidence is that where countries have been successful in alleviating poverty, they have probably also been unsuccessful at conserving biodiversity. For the paper by Sachs et al, the relationship between poverty and biodiversity was proxied by a relationship uh, between the log rate of human infant mortality and the number of threatened species per one degree grid square. So anything that's colored in this shade would indicate both high levels of species threat and high levels of poverty. It turns out that in the places where species are most at risk and where income has been increasing, the level of risk to species has also been increasing. Reporting a, a recent result here uh, that involves myself and a colleague in Greece, George Halkos, we analyzed the relationship between the same measures of threat to species and per capita income in 109 different countries. And we found that income changes are positively correlated with stress on biodiversity. This is, effect is weaker for some species than for others. It's weaker for mammals than for birds or plants but it holds for all taxonomic groups. There's a slightly different relationship between habitat conversion and the number of threatened species. That uh, relationship is negative for mammals and birds, but insignificant for plants. But this is the one I want to think about a little bit more uh, carefully. The relationship between income and threats to biodiversity for all taxonomic groups. This shows what the relationship between the number of threatened species and gross national income per capita is for each of these three. What you'll notice is that as gross national income per capita increases, the threat to species itself first increases and then later decline. 
So for countries that are very poor, that have very low levels of per capita income, there is first of all a rising threat to species. And this follows directly from the fact that there are uh, the same things that drive species uh, 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 loss also drive income gain. Conversion of habitat to the production of foods, fuels, and fibers is what is the first thing that drives income gain, but that also drives species loss. We took a look to see whether this relationship is different for different levels of risk, and we found that it is different for different levels of risk where the risk is low. So these figures here give the uh, coefficient on uh, the various uh, independent variables in the model that was estimated as a function of the level of risk. This uh, dotted line denotes the mean, so this is the estimate you would get from a simple regression, and the green line represents the estimates for each quantile. And the only point I would make here is that the results that I showed you a moment ago hold for all levels of risk other than very low levels of risk. So there are points where the risk is very low, where the relationship is different, but if you look at the higher levels of risk, the mean estimate is not a bad proxy. So the threat that we were talking about, the relationship between biodiversity, threats, and income appears to be robust with respect to the level of risk. So let's think now why this might be true. And look at two systems, natural systems and more heavily impacted systems. For natural systems, the problem is that the same things that drive income growth also increase stress on terrestrial species. And these are well known. Conversion of habitat for agricultural production, a primary driver of loss of species. Application of fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides. All of these are aimed to reduce certain species directly, crop uh, pests, livestock pests, crop predators, uh, crop competitors, and so on but they have the effect of reducing other forms of biodiversity as well. There's collateral damage. Agroecosystems are somewhat different uh, in the sense that they are more heavily um, deliberately managed, but there there is a, a, a different problem. And the problem within agroecosystems is that there's been a selection of high yielding varieties that has displaced land rises and displaced traditional livestock strains. So in both cases, there's a loss of biodiversity. In both cases, driven by an interest in increasing income. So our problem is to go against all of this evidence and say, what can we do that's different, that will build wealth, but will not threaten biodiversity? That's the challenge that was laid down in the Sachs paper, and that's the challenge I'm going to talk about. I'm going to focus on agroecosystems, and I'm going to begin by thinking about the nature of that wealth and how that has changed in the last 30 years. So let me go back to before 1992, before Rio of 92. How did we think about our collective ownership of biodiversity? Well, if you look at a couple of instruments here, look at the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, that defined all the resources of sea areas beyond national jurisdiction as the common heritage of humankind. There was collective ownership of those assets, the assets within the oceans. If we take a look at the first of the uh, international instruments that deals with uh, biodiversity and terrestrial systems, the International Undertaking on Plant Genetic Resources, 
that's 1983, that declared that it's a universally accepted principle that plant genetic resources are a heritage of mankind and consequently should be available without restriction. So that was our starting point. Collectively, we had this vision that the world's biodiversity was part of the common heritage of humankind. That's changed, and it's changed very substantially. There are two trends that one observes since the 1980s. One is the arrogation of common heritage rights to genetic resources by nation states. So nation states have taken property in those common heritage resources. The second is the assignment of intellectual property rights for the results of plant breeding and genetic modification. And most of that's reflected in uh, the UPOF Convention. I'll have more to say about this later. Um, but it's also reflected in patent rights. These two trends have, in a sense, changed the way that we regard ownership of biodiversity. So look at the Convention on Biological Diversity. Remember that under the previous instruments, they referred to resources of the seas and terrestrial systems as the common heritage of humankind. In the Convention on Biological Diversity, it's declared to be a common concern of humankind, but it's also stated that states have sovereign rights over their own biological resources. And Article 15 of the CBD declares that access to genetic resources rests with national governments and is subject to national legislation. So rights to biodiversity have been taken by nation states. It's an important uh, characteristic of the last uh, three decades that one needs to understand. The International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, which is the one that matters for the problem I'm interested in, was written to be compatible with the CBD. So it respects this same principle. So who owns biodiversity? Well, if we had gone back uh, beyond 1993, we would have said, and looked at, by the way, these modified ecosystems, we'd have said that individual farming communities would have been able to claim prior rights to land races and traditional livestock spreads. But the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources and the Convention on Biological Diversity both assert that countries have got sovereign rights. Now, sovereignty is not property rights but it allows one to confer property rights. And in many countries, what is happening is that governments are declaring that there is state ownership of genetic resources. Now, the ways in which these are translated into rights uh, is increasingly through two sets of systems. In the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, uh, the dominant method of protecting rights is via the patent system. Uh, elsewhere, there are sui generis systems of plant breeders' rights. Sui generis, these are just uh, uh, systems of rights that are created for the case at hand. And most of those are allocated under the International Convention for Protection of New Plant Varieties. Now, what do they do? Well, both of these rights give uh, exclusive rights to inventions, but plant breeders' rights give the users the right to use any plant breeding material without prior consent. That's the main difference between those two sets of rights. In both cases, individuals, companies, firms, farmers, have rights, property rights, to the intellectual property contained in a plant breed. 
These normally have to be stable, they have to be replicable, and they have to be compatible with the seed laws of the countries concerned. That excludes most land races. Farmers' rights under the International Treaty on Plant Genetic uh, Material uh, are defined in terms of the rights of access that farmers have. I'll elaborate on that in a moment, but first let me just give you some background on what kinds of rights we'll be talking about. First point to make is that if we're interested in wealth, we're interested in asset holdings, and if we're interested in the wealth of the rural poor, we're interested in the asset holdings of the rural poor. What assets do they own? The ones of interest to them are land, water, and the biota of the system. And so those are the rights that we're interested in. There are three classes of those. Use rights, which is just the right to use. Ownership rights, the right to sell or transfer title. And control rights, which is the right to determine who should have access, how they should be used, and who should benefit. A lot of rural communities do not have the right to sell or transfer title because these are collectively owned resources. But they have the right to use and they have the right to control. In some instances, they don't have this right either. What farmers' rights are intended to cover is the use that may be made of genetic resources, the access to genetic resources, but they, by and large, do not include the ownership of genetic resources. So under the treaty, um, states have got sovereign rights over plant genetic resources, and farmers' rights are defined in the following terms. To save, to use, to exchange and sell farm-saved seed, so this is not intellectual property, it's the seed you have produced on farm. And to participate in decision making regarding the fair and equitable sharing of benefits. But farmers do not have property rights in the intellectual property of land races or traditional livestock strains or of wild crop relatives. They do not have ownership. The problem within agroecosystems is, it will be familiar to many people in this room, there's been significant genetic erosion, and that genetic erosion has followed from the shift from traditional to modern production systems. The move away from traditional um, livestock strains and land races in favor of high-yielding varieties that have a different source of origin, that are released each year by the breeding companies like Monsanto, like Cargill. And what we've lost in the process is many of these land races. What are land races? Well, they're plants that are morphologically distinct, that have some genetic integrity, but are also genetically variable and dynamic. This is the critical characteristic of land races. And they've got distinctive properties that make them useful to different people at different times. What's driving the loss of these is partly the integration of isolated communities, the fact that people have been brought into the international market system, and partly also the availability of alternative higher yielding varieties. So the displacement of land races by modern varieties has resulted in the disappearance of many land races. There's a big upside, of course. High yielding varieties have increased average productivity dramatically. They've enabled the world to feel the, feed a growing population um, they've generated global food surpluses, 
There have always been local food scarcities, but there's been a definite upside to the adoption of high-yielding varieties. But this is the downside. And it's a downside which has, in a sense, occurred almost without notice. And the reason it's occurred is because nobody has had ownership in and interest in the preservation of land races. Well, it turns out that we now have a reason to think that the preservation of land races may not be a bad thing. Uh, and the reason that uh, we do think this is climate change. Climate change is altering the conditions under which crops are going to be grown worldwide. If we maintain land races, we maintain the natural process of in situ evolution of these crop varieties and give them an opportunity to self-select to meet the changed environmental conditions that they're likely to experience in the future. But note that these land races have been the local wealth of people for centuries. The loss of that local wealth is not in a sense felt by those people because they've never been able to realize the gains from maintaining that wealth. And what I'm going to look at is the possibility for restoring the rights that would give people an interest in maintaining uh, the, the gains from that wealth. Now note that the characteristic of land races that make them useful is precisely because they are genetically dynamic, that they change over time. Their conservation needs therefore to be in situ. It is not sufficient to have land races preserved ex situ in collections around the world. And the global community has got a definite interest in encouraging local land holders to maintain land races. And not just land races, but also the wild crop relatives with which they interact. So let me just think about a local example. Now this is not an example I know a huge amount about. All of the, the repository of knowledge on this problem lies with people in this room, lies with Canabio and the efforts that it's been putting into this. But I'm going to use this as just a, a model species, if you like, to explore this question of what are the property rights that can increase the wealth of local communities. So, of course, Mexico is a center of origin in this species, which is what makes it of interest here, that many of the land races are preserved currently in Mexico, and it's an area where there has been the same threat uh, in terms of genetic erosion, that the genetic diversity of maize is being eroded to, due to replacement by modern cultivars. And it turns out that the most important of the wild relatives, Tiacente, is also threatened for the same reasons. So we can think about this as a species that is, in a sense, the, has the characteristics of many of the species that are currently at risk in many parts of the world, but that are controlled by the rural poor. The two ways in which preservation of species of this kind are being approached is partly through public measures of conservation. So public measures of conservation could include, for example, declaration of uh, reserve areas to conserve wild relatives. They could include the establishment of Conavia would be an example of a public measure designed to conserve not just species of this kind, but many others. There are public efforts to enter into the conservation of species. Private measures, these are the ones that I would like to think about. It turns out that even though there are new higher yielding varieties, some of the land races are still being maintained, and they're being maintained for 
the same reasons that the global community should be interested in these species, to cope with environmental heterogeneity, to cope with the existence of emergent pests and diseases, as well as meeting local demand. So let's consider what the system of rights is. And again, this is not an area where I'm an expert, uh, but I'm looking at a system of rights in Mexico that I see replicated in other places. Some of these things are very familiar when you look at other countries. Others are somewhat unique. Uh, it turns out that the system of farmers' rights is still being developed here, so it's in a process of flux. There was a bill to moderate, uh, to modify the federal law on plant varieties that's temporarily been withdrawn. Um, that bill would have extended both patent and plant breeders' rights. One of the reasons that it was withdrawn because there are alternatives proposed for different kinds of systems of rights. Um, and I'm guessing that this is a, a problem which is still up in the air. It's still open for debate in Mexico. What is unique about Mexico is that it has an article of the Constitution that protects, not explicitly it turns out, I went and read Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution, and you cannot find explicit reference to biodiversity, but it does protect natural resources more generally. Um, so in principle, these are protected as part of the national patrimony. I'm going to argue the following. I'm going to argue that establishing ownership of land races and wild crop relatives has the capacity to increase the wealth of the communities one might be most interested in lifting from current states of poverty. And it can do so both by increasing wealth and by giving those communities an incentive to protect an asset of value. But they won't protect that asset unless it has value, and that's the key. Every economist in the room will understand that if the incentives do not drive you in a certain direction, then you're never going to be able to achieve that direction. So the incentives have to be compatible with the targets that you have in mind. And I'm going to argue that there is a system of rights that will do that. So what are we doing at the moment? Let me give you some examples. Under Article 15 of the CBD, remember that there is a, a, a statement that governments have national sovereignty over the biodiversity within those countries. But Article 15 also potentially creates a market for access to genetic resources and potentially creates uh, a market for traditional local knowledge. But for a market to exist, there have to be rights and the assets to be transacted. Markets don't exist without the people who are parties to an exchange having the rights to make that exchange. So let's look at three examples of the way that this is currently being done. And then what I'm going to do is close with a, a discussion of what might be done in a different way. There are common features to the way many of these things are operated. My first example from Ethiopia, uh, as Article 15 of the CBD says, the access to genetic resources has to come through local legislation. Well, the national legislation governing access in Ethiopia is the Access to Genetic Resources and Community Knowledge and Community Rights Proclamation. This governs the exploration of genetic resources by foreign companies, foreign entities. It provides um, 50% of benefits in money, and this can take the form of license fees, there are some upfront payments, milestone payments, royalties, and so on, or research funding. But whether the money gets to the local community is at the whim of the government. The government can choose 
to spend any of the money it receives from such companies in the local community or not? It's an open question. India. Here the instrument is the India Biological Diversity Act. It requires foreign users of genetic resources to make payments. Again, these take the form of access fees, sometimes these things up front and milestone payments, sometimes royalties and research funding. But it also includes some provision for joint ventures, product development and venture capital funding. So it would say, if you wish to invest in the development of um, a crop variety that uses some land race, then you will need to take local partners. They will have to become part of your business. So there is another mechanism there for including local interests. In Australia, the relevant act there is the Australia Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And that requires users again to provide monetary benefits in the form of these various uh, payments. But there's also license fees in the case of commercialization and special fees paid to trust funds. Now, all of these are resources that go to national governments. And the rights to obtain those resources rest with national governments. You will have spent in the past day and through the rest of today, I think, much time talking about payments for ecosystem services as a mechanism for paying local communities for conservation actions. Um, and it's well understood how payments for ecosystem services work. It's also well understood that unless there are contracts for the provision of those services, you're unlikely to achieve the target. Up to now, most PES schemes have been closely connected to deforestation and to carbon sequestration as well, the dominant scheme being the red scheme, which many people here will be familiar with. But I think there is an opportunity for identifying an alternative set of rights. So let me come back to the question I started with, which is, can sustainable management of biodiversity help the poor in Mexico? And I think that the answer to that is yes, but not under the system of property rights that currently exists. I think the answer is yes, providing that those who are the poor are assigned the wealth that will enable themselves to lift themselves out of poverty. And what are the property rights in assets that we're talking about? Well, I think we're talking about intellectual property rights in both land races and endemic wild relatives. There's a characteristic, though, of land races and wild relatives that has meant that they're not available for conventional patent or plant breeders' rights. It's that they are not dynamically stable. Consequently, if one is going to assign rights to these things, then those rights need themselves to be dynamic. So the rights need to be, in a sense, dated to the moment of abstraction. You can think about this as the right that would right to a vintage of wine would be an example. The characteristics of wines from year to year are different. The characteristics of land races from year to year are different. They evolve over time. And therefore, one needs to think about time-dependent sets of rights. Remember that under a patent system or a plant breeder's rights system, People enjoy time-limited rights to exploit. It's okay to apply time-limited rights to exploit to land races. But for each vintage of land race, for each year, a time-limited right would give exclusive rights to exploit the genetic material only for 
whatever the time period would be, 18 years or through to 25 years, which is the current proposal. But because each vintage is different, you could imagine a set of rights that would be associated with each vintage going into the future. That implies that there would be scope for direct payment systems, including royalties, to the owners of those rights if those rights are communities. And then at the community level, a system of payments for ecosystem services, a mechanism that would compensate individual breeders within the community. Now this is different from the way in which such rights have been envisaged up to this point. But unless we can think about a different way to incentivate conservation in the uh, land races and traditional livestock strains, we stand very little chance of halting genetic erosion. And if we cannot halt genetic erosion, we lose the capacity to maintain the breeding stock, the breeding material that will serve global interests for the next several decades. So at that point I'm going to say uh, it's an open issue as to whether or not uh, Mexico or any other country is going to tackle this issue in ways that are more imaginative than those envisaged under the international treaty or under the Convention on Biological Diversity. But Mexico has an opportunity to do this. It's at a moment when the debate about farmers' rights is still in process. So there is an opportunity for Mexico to go beyond the Convention on Biological Diversity or the International Treaty and to give the rural poor both the assets they need to bring them out of poverty and the incentives that they need. Thank you. I'm going to now open the floors to some questions, if sure. that's all right. Oops. Thank you, Chuck, for the talk. It was very interesting. There are a few commentaries. Uh, I think that the sliding which you put the number of races should be changed. The last study by Conavio establishes that there are at least and I say at least because we didn't really comb the whole territory because of lack of time, at least 60 native races, which also speaks the, of the fact that we were expecting a certain loss. There, there were some assessments of the number of, of, of native races, but it, it certainly was very surprising to see that large number of races with the difficulty of, of separating one race from another, which is a, a, a matter of a taxonomic sort of uh, issue, but it, it's very close to 60, 59, 60, 61. And, and um, there might be even more uh, in some areas which we didn't have the chance to go into it. And speaks of the fact that despite of all the pressure of some seed companies, and despite the negligence of the Mexican government along many decades, probably just after the Green Revolution where the World Bank and the IMF declared that the uh, food problems of the world had been solved, so there was no need to invest public monies into agricultural research, uh, that has fallen down a lot and uh, with it a number of other accompanying actions like uh, extension work, uh, production of seed to be uh, distributed to people, etc. Uh, it was really surprising to see that that number of, of races were still there. And that takes me to the second point that I don't, uh, at least in the case of Mexico, and I would suppose it is very much the same in areas where you have that many domesticated plants like you have in Mexico. Uh, that you can give communities ownership of a race because of the way in which people share seeds 
constantly and they, they are experimenting with new seeds that they bring, they grow it, they cross it, they see if they get something new, if it's interesting they keep it, if it's not they discard it. So th there is a pool of, of, of use of the genetic material of, I wouldn't say of all the 60 races because some are not adapted to other places but but certainly there is there, there is a, 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 a an important sharing of these things which will make it very difficult to, to really assign the property of, of a race to a community uh, and uh, probably the last thing that I would say that you need what, what we need in Mexico to to conserve is the process of, of the production of maize the, the milpa system or the or, or the process by which people still are every day experiment well every day every year experimenting new races trying to sort of select new material which is the the, the agricultural process the natural agricultural process that has given ber, uh, rise to to so many races uh, native races of, of of Mexico and quite agree with you that that is the in situ way of, of protecting the, this uh, variation of, of, uh, of this natural capital. And the last commentary will be that it's not only the agrobiodiversity which is the biodiversity that can be useful and beneficial for people, it's also the, all, the rest of biodiversity, you know this very well, and uh, which it's the other area in which we are really trying to concern ourselves on, on how to, to use that ecosystem biodiversity in order to, to uh, provide um, incomes and, and means of elevating the well-being of, of people in the country. Thank you very much for it. Well, thank you for those uh, comments, Jose. Is this, is this on? Yes, it is. Um, I guess the, the, the one thing I would observe is that if you take a look at uh, some of the uh, released varieties uh, coming out of Simit, for example, there will be individual varieties that include plant material from 20, 30 countries and from 2,000 or more crosses. And it's still possible in those cases to keep track of who owned what. Um, and the system of, uh, of patent rights is, is in a sense well designed to keep track, but it will only work if there are well-defined rights. And so uh, the suggestion I'm making is that unless one can establish those rights, it's not then possible to do any of the accounting that you need to do to provide individual communities with incentives. The other thing is uh, the community would be defined very broadly, right? If you think about the range of a land race, there may be many, many different taquitos involved. And so there would have to be some correspondence between those things. And, and the only other observ observation I'd make on, on what otherwise I think is, is uh, all very well taken comments is that the, um, the example of maize is, just happens to be one that may be uh, particularly interesting for, for the audience, but the same thing could be said of any of the plants where people's management has altered the genetic content of those plants. Um, and that some of these are going to be traditional food crops, many are going to be non-traditional, non-forest products non-timber uh, products. Well, my comment is that the, the maintenance of the traditional milpa system, the conservation of land crops in situ, um, has become harder and harder since NAFTA, since the uh, North American trade agreement because the prices of corn and the cultivated land has decreased by 30% and now corn plant of corn is very much concentrated in north and west of Mexico under a very industrial, heavily subsidized uh, system uh, with uh, industrial varieties because of, of prices. So, I mean, 
I think it's very nice as, as a proposal, but whether it's possible without the, the frame of a new agricultural policy and uh, a new North American agricultural policy that values uh, genetic biodiversity and resilience that drives from it. You're right, it requires more than just a marginal change in policy. You're absolutely right. But what, we're describe, what you've described is exactly the problem. And it's a problem that occurs worldwide. What is at risk is all of the genetic material that should be available to future plant breeders that will benefit people around the world. Maize is now the world's largest crop more than anything else. And the genetic material that's being conserved in Mexico offers benefits to consumers in the future in every country where maize is grown. That is a very significant value and it needs to be realized if the land races are to be protected. Realizing the value does mean moving beyond the CBD and moving beyond the international treaty on plant genetic resources. It, it requires that um, the regional trade agreements like NAFTA should also adapt to a new system. So yes, there's a big challenge there, but once you recognize the dangers in the existing system, then you have an incentive to start thinking about alternatives. Voy a hacer una de las preguntas que tengo acá y después volvemos a pasar el micrófono que Antonio había levantado la mano para darle. Ah, no, perdón. Había entendido que querías la palabra. Uh, I, I have I have two questions here that I can I can put together. The, the first one is on genetic resources. It says that uh, this would be refused rights, refused rights. So the implementation of rights to communities would be difficult. Maybe the government has the advantage of managing those resources and income, obviously, you're oriented towards the poor. And there's also another one. Uh, someone says that uh, they, he, he agrees on giving intellectual property rights to, to peasants, but how do you avoid the existence of monopolies? Well, the latter is the easiest to, um, to answer. At the moment, governments have claimed a monopoly. And if you give the rights to the communities that have taken historic responsibility for generating land races, for supporting wild relatives, you break that monopoly. So it does, it does deal with that issue. I think we have become used to the idea that governments take responsibility for um, genetic resources in agriculture and elsewhere. We become used to this notion, but it's time that we started thinking more imaginatively. It is not the case that uh, the success of global agriculture is going to lie only in the efforts of bodies like the CGIAR. Important though they are, and they are extremely important, the success of future agriculture is going to lie in the hands of the people who've been doing the plant breeding in an independent way around the world. And in fact, what we've been doing for the last 50 years is what is a major cause for concern. Thank you. ¿Hay alguien que quiera hacer alguna pregunta? I have another one here. How can communities address the issue of big pharma pharmaceutical companies extracting the genetic diversity of bacteria on critical protected environments and getting no monetary gain on the patents? Um, again, I, I, these are all very good examples of what's wrong with the current system. So um, in this part of the world, there have been very imaginative ways of trying to capture some of the benefits of bioprospecting. Uh, in Costa Rica, the InBio Institute has, for some years, uh, generated a flow of funds that uh, derives from uh, fees paid by bioprospectors. But if you want to ensure 
that communities are compensated for genetic material or for the uh, compounds contained within living species that are abstracted from their regions, then you need to have a system of rights that rests with those communities. It may be true that by themselves they would be hard put to negotiate with international um, pharmaceutical companies. So individual communities would have difficulty in taking uh, a company like Merck uh, to court in the United States. But this is an area where it should be possible to get support from bodies that have significant funds, like the Gates Foundation, to establish a fund to protect the rights of individual communities, to provide that legal support to enforce local rights. Governments could also have a role in that. But my sense is that if you're engaging in legal action to protect rights internationally, then you would be better off sourcing uh, the support for that from other than governments. Thank you. I have another question here. In, in your paper with Halkos, that you mentioned in your presentation, you use the genuine savings indicator of sustainability used by the World Bank. And I was uh, wondering what your opinion is on uh, how it is a good indicator of uh, sustainability when talking about biodiversity, since it is a weak sustainable indicator which allows for the substitution between natural capital and other forms of capital. This is a broader question about weak versus stronger sustainability. Um, just a word about the indicator and then about weak sustainability. The indicator is better than indicators that we've been using in the past, the, the savings measures that come out of the national income accounts. But it's not very much better. It includes some natural resource stocks, like oil, like minerals, um, like standing timber. It does not include most of biodiversity. So we should be looking for better measures than we get from the World Bank. But because it does better than measures such as GDP or the savings measures that come out of the national income accounts, we should be pushing it in favor of those measures. We should also try to improve it. Weak versus strong sustainability. My conviction is that we do face real choices in substituting between different forms of assets. So my conviction is that we are in a world where we should be thinking about substitutability. Not every resource is going to be substituted, but many can be. And what we ought to be asking ourselves is whether we take into account the full social opportunity cost of a resource when we engage in an action that substitutes one from another. It's not going to be helpful to say, don't touch the environment, because that's not going to happen. What we should say is, if you are going to touch the environment, make sure you do so with your eyes open. Make sure that you understand the consequences of your action. And when you do understand the consequences of your action, and it is still in your interest to convert some aspect to the natural environment, then do so. I think we have time for one last question. Sorry, it's the handwriting. Uh, farmer rights give empowerment that's desirable, but intellectual property dynamic is not precisely the logic behind the Mirbas. Uh, as a diverse ecosystem and as in situ conservation hotspot. How can intellectual treaties help strengthen traditional knowledge and practical without you just subscribing them, sorry, to market dynamics? Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure if I fully understand that, but I, I understand the general sentiment that says that 
um, we're talking about two different categories. Intellectual property rights have been developed by a community that is based on patent systems and is based on international agreements. The Milpa system was developed as many other slash and burn systems around the world to deal with the local uh, regeneration of soils and is associated with a world where land has not been scarce. Okay, these are different categories. But given that the world has changed and given that um, it is no longer the case that the Milpa system could be maintained indefinitely into the future. How can one construct a system of incentives that keeps the best, most conservation-oriented aspects of that system and gives the people in that system an incentive to conserve as much as possible? That's the question. So in a changed world, where you can't, other than creating human uh, natural reserves, as has been done in some parts of the world, but it's, it's not really desirable to create an uh, in situ conservation of people. That doesn't seem to me to be the right way to go. If we reject that, and if we say that everyone has to have a place in the same world, then we need to change the, the uh, structure of incentives and change the way we think about the integration of such things as traditional milpa and international agreements and national policy. It's not sufficient to say that the milpa can be maintained as a system intact forever in the future without fundamental change to the rules governing the behavior of those who are in that system. Thank you very much, Professor Perings. You're welcome. Thanks again for being here with us. Big pleasure to have you around. Thank and you. I, I'm sure we all enjoyed your presentation very much. We vamos a tener la presentación disponible en la hoja de Conavio y también en la hoja de la maestría en economía del ITAM para que la puedan eh, accesar. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much again. Thank you.